Hello everyone, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. And before we get started, make sure you guys go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every Wednesday on all podcast platforms and on YouTube as well. And you're not going to want to miss it. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about a case that is currently in the process of unraveling. It's a case that you guys may have heard of on the news or in the media, and that is the brutal murder of Becky Bleefnick. This is a horrific case, and it's one that I think deserves a lot of attention. So with that being said, let's jump right on into it today. Becky Bleefnick was born on November 19th of 1981 in Quincy, Illinois, to her parents, William and Bernadette. Becky grew up as the youngest of two daughters and was incredibly close to her older sister, Sarah. Growing up, Becky attended Payson Seymour Elementary School before moving on to attend Quincy Notre Dame High School. Becky was incredibly intelligent and graduated high school as the valedictorian in her class. Something to know about Becky is that she was incredibly motivated and hardworking. She was able to accomplish whatever she set her mind to. She went on to attend Quincy University where she studied and got a degree in biological science and minored in chemistry. She graduated cum laude in college before moving on to work at Santa Fe Aventis, which is a pharmaceutical company, and to no one's surprise, Becky thrived in her work environment and was one of the company's top performing pharmaceutical sales representatives. And although Becky was thriving in her work environment, she had bigger dreams. Her dreams involved being more hands-on with her patients and really being able to make a difference. And that is why she wanted to move forward with becoming a nurse. Becky attended Blessing Ryman College of Nursing and Health Sciences and graduated summa cum laude from there. Becky actually had her third child while she was in nursing school and only ended up missing one day of classes. After graduating from nursing school, Becky moved on to begin working at the Quincy Medical Group in the gastrointestinal surgery department before transferring to a different hospital called Blessings Hospital to be a nurse in their emergency room. Becky was also a travel nurse all throughout the COVID pandemic, and she was even nominated for a DAISY Award in 2020, which is essentially honoring the exceptional work done by nurses. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how dedicated she was and how loved she was by her patients. Now, as devoted and determined as Becky was in her professional life, the one thing that mattered to her even more than that was her family life and more specifically her children. While Becky was attending Quincy University, she ended up meeting a man named Tim Bleefnick. In the beginning of their relationship, the two of them moved to Chicago together before heading back to Quincy, Illinois and getting married on November 8th of 2009. Together, Becky and Tim had three boys together. And like I said, these boys were Becky's entire world. Becky even had a dedicated Twitter page for funny and silly things that her kids would say that she wanted to remember. She was a boy mom through and through, and she absolutely loved it. She was incredibly hands-on. She was the mom that was putting together the Halloween costumes from scratch. She was taking the boys to their sports practices. She was always there for every school event, all while maintaining a very demanding job, and she never once complained. Becky was also very involved in philanthropy. She was constantly volunteering, whether that was for her kids' school, putting together the luncheons, or organizing different dances or parent-teacher conferences, all the way to volunteering at different animal rescue and shelters. It was just something that was ingrained in her. It was who she was to her core. She was the type of person that always wanted to help wherever she could. And that really is the standout characteristic that Becky's family and friends lean on. They remember her as always being the one that you could call no matter what time, day or night, she was always going to be there and show up for the people that she cared about and the people that she loved. 
Now, even though Becky was thriving in her professional life, she was thriving with her children, her friends, her family, something that was really suffering in Becky's life was her marriage to Tim. Becky and Tim had been having problems in their marriage for several years. However, those problems really started to hit the surface in the year 2020. And when it came to the future of their marriage, Becky and Tim had two very different viewpoints on how they should proceed. Becky was trying to do everything she could to save her marriage. She asked Tim to go to couples counseling, to do family counseling, to talk through their problems together. She really wanted to save the marriage for the sake of their children. She wanted her boys to grow up in a happy household with both their mom and their dad. And that was something that was really important to her. So she was constantly trying to ask Tim for ways that they could work through their problems. However, for Tim, he was very much so on the side of wanting a divorce, and Becky was aware of this. Becky even told her sister Sarah about seven to eight months prior to being served with divorce papers that she believed that Tim was going to file. It was just a matter of when. So ultimately, Tim ended up filing for divorce from Becky in January 2021. The two ended up physically separating. However, they really did maintain in close proximity to each other because their houses were actually only about a mile away from each other on the same street. Now, in the beginning of the divorce process, there were several temporary orders of request that were filed by Becky. The first was that Becky wanted Tim to return her 9mm handgun that she purchased that she believed that Tim stole. Becky went on to say that if she did not get her gun back from Tim, she wanted him to pay the $800 value of the gun. Along with that, Becky wanted to make sure that her kids would have no unsupervised contact with Tim's father, Ray. This was something that was really non-negotiable for her, and as much as I tried to dig up the information as to why, the question as to why has not been released to the public, but Becky was very, very adamant that she did not want her kids alone unsupervised with Tim's father, Ray. Now, Tim also had some requests as well. His request included a 60-40 custody agreement in favor of him, as well as the fact that he wanted his father to be able to have unsupervised visits with his kids, as well as paying no child support and for him to take possession of the house that the two of them lived together. When Becky saw those terms, she immediately rejected them and ended up filing a restraining order against Tim, as well as as his father, Ray. And in turn, Tim filed a restraining order against her as well. Now, the process of going through all of these requests were extremely tenuous and contentious for both Becky and Tim, and the two were actually set to go to divorce court in February of this year, so February 2023. The reason for going to divorce court was so that Becky and Tim could finally have a proper layout for what the assets and the custody of agreement were going to be moving forward. However, unfortunately, that never happened. So this now leads us to February 23rd of 2023. For the few days leading up to the 23rd, Tim was the one who had visitation with the boys and they were supposed to switch off on the 23rd. Becky was meant to pick them up from school that day. But instead, after multiple attempts of Tim texting and calling Becky, he ended up reaching out to Becky's father, William, asking if he had heard from Becky all day, to which William replied that he had not. Tim told William that it was Becky's day to pick up the boys from school. However, she was not answering. So after multiple failed attempts by Becky's father to get in touch with her, William ultimately decided that he was going to drive over to Becky's house himself. When William pulled up into the driveway of Becky's home, the first thing he noticed was that Becky's front door was open. Immediately when seeing this, William had a bad feeling that something was wrong. Becky was always the person to lock her doors, lock her windows. She was not the type to freely leave the door open. William walked into Becky's home and began calling out for Becky's name. He searched all through the downstairs and then made his way upstairs to where Becky's room was. When he got to Becky's room and ultimately to Becky's bathroom, that is where he found his daughter, laying on her bathroom floor with what appeared to be several gunshot wounds. 
After discovering Becky's body, William immediately ran over to Becky's neighbor's house and called 911 because he forgot his cell phone, and paramedics and authorities arrived immediately. When authorities examined the crime scene, they found several pieces of plastic surrounding Becky's body. There was also a towel and an ice pack found in her underwear that she was wearing, and they also discovered multiple bullet casings surrounding her body as well. The autopsy of Becky's body was performed by Dr. Scott Denton, who had performed over 12,000 autopsies throughout his career. Dr. Denton stated that Becky had surgery herself several days prior to her murder, and that explains why she was wearing surgical pants and compression pads. And the compression pads that Becky was wearing was the reason why there was not a lot of blood surrounding Becky's body, because the compression pads were soaking up the blood. The autopsy revealed that Becky's cause of death was gunshot wounds and that she had been shot 14 times. 14 times. Nine of those shots were to Becky's chest, three were to her right arm, and two were to her left hand. Dr. Denton was able to confirm that none of the gunshot wounds to Becky were immediately fatal. However, he was able to notice that Becky internally bled to death. One of the gunshot wounds paralyzed Becky from the waist down, and another went through her lungs, which caused shortness of breath, and that, along with the internal bleeding, caused her death. Now, when police began their investigation, one of the first things that they noticed was that the window in Becky's second story bedroom was open. And to police, this meant that there was sign of forced entry. Surrounding Becky's body, police were able to discover eight shell casings. However, unfortunately, they were not able to uncover any fingerprints throughout the house. And they were also able to see that Becky's bedroom door had been broken, and it appeared that Becky tried to lock out her attacker. However, the door was broken in. Police also discovered Becky's cell phone on the floor of her bedroom behind the bedroom door, and they were able to see that Becky had attempted to call 911. Police discovered a crowbar on the floor as well as a shoe imprint in the carpet of Becky's bedroom, and that is where they pieced two and two together that the crowbar was the weapon that was used to open that second story window to get into Becky's bedroom. Now, police spoke to multiple of Becky's neighbors, asking them if they had seen or heard anything suspicious in the early morning hours of the 23rd. However, all of Becky's neighbors claimed that they did not hear a single thing. However, later on in the morning, Becky's neighbors did see that her front door was left open, which they did find to be odd. Now, luckily, one of Becky's neighbors actually has a security camera that was able to capture a little bit of footage from the early morning hours of February 23rd. At 1.05 a.m., this security camera caught footage of someone walking up Becky's driveway and then walking away at 1.53 a.m. However, due to the angle, the person was not able to be identified, but the timing did match up because police looked into Becky's security system and saw that her front door was open at 1.13 a.m. on February 23rd. Police also spoke with Becky's son's school, who told them that on the 23rd, Tim had called them to tell them that he could not get in touch with Becky that day and that he would be the one picking up the kids instead of her. So in the beginning of the investigation, police did not have a lot of physical evidence to go on. They had a lot of bits and pieces of odd information, odd things that happened throughout the night. However, no physical evidence that they were able to maintain to help lead them to their killer. However, after Becky's death, family and friends of Becky's started coming forward to police, and this is when red flags started to raise. After Becky's murder, there were several of Becky's friends and family who came forward to police to tell them that leading up to her death, Becky was in fear for her safety. 
Becky told several of her family and friends that she was afraid of her ex-husband, Tim. Becky even went as far as to tell people that if anything were to ever happen to her, that Tim would be the one who had done it. In 2021, Becky had texted a friend of hers saying that she was having a panic attack, thinking about what Tim is capable of and said, quote, I'm scared of what he might do and his erratic behavior, end quote. In that same year of 2021, Becky also texted her sister saying, quote, if something ever happens to me, make sure the number one person of interest is Tim because that's who would do something to me. I'm putting this in writing because I'm fearful that he will somehow harm me, come after me, or will try to do something that takes me away from the kids or the kids away from me. He has already lied multiple times to paint himself as a victim and me as a perpetrator when it is absolutely the other way around. No, I have not sent this to mom and dad because I don't want them to be out of their mind with worry. End quote. Becky was also very transparent with some of her friends and family saying that the reason that Tim had been threatening her was because Tim did not want Becky to have any of his money following the divorce. There were multiple assets like the house and different items that were going to be at stake for Tim after this divorce had gone through and be finalized. And Tim told Becky, quote, you will die before you have any of my money. End quote. So with all of this being said, it is probably no surprise to you when I tell you that the first person the police wanted to look into in this investigation was Tim Bleefnik. Between the worrisome comments that Becky's family and friends were making, along with the tension that was rising during their divorce process, it was no surprise to anyone really that Tim became the police's prime person of interest. At first, police were able to get a search warrant for Tim's house and went through the home on March 1st of 2023 and when they did that they collected several items the first item that they found in tim's house or the first couple items that they found in tim's house were crowbars they found one crowbar in the basement of tim's home as well as several other crowbars scattered throughout the house that they ended up collecting Police also discovered 27 shell casings in Tim's basement, and they were able to take those shell casings and match them to the ones that were found in Becky's home. And when they did that, they discovered that the shell casings in the basement and the shell casings that killed Becky were the exact same. Police were able to look through Tim's phone records and also found several disturbing searches that Tim had made on his phone. These searches included how to make my door open with a crowbar, can I force my door open with a crowbar if I lock myself out, and how to make a homemade pistol silencer. There were also various types of gloves found in Tim's basement, including white latex gloves. They also discovered plastic bags from an Aldi's grocery store that they believe were used as Tim's homemade pistol silencer. Now, the gloves that were discovered were not able to be tested for any gunshot residue because too much time had passed since Becky's murder. However, police did discover more ammunition in Tim's garage, including 9mm bullets found in a box, which was the same type of shell casings that were found at the crime scene of Becky's home. And as I mentioned earlier, Becky herself did have a 9mm gun that she believed Tim stole from her. So this really led police to the question of was Becky murdered by her own gun? When searching through Tim's home, police found a gun safe in Tim's bedroom. However, when they opened it, the gun safe was empty. Tim did have a second 9mm handgun that he had purchased himself and kept in the downstairs area of his home. However, Becky's gun has yet to be recovered. Another big thing that struck police's attention was a bike that was found near Tim's home. 
The bike was not seemingly broken or had any flat tires, but the bike was left next to a garage located about a block from Tim's house. Police were able to track the bike being sold by a man on Facebook Marketplace in October of 2022. The man said that he did not remember who he sold the bike to, but he did say that the man purchased the bike in cash. Tim also had another bike in his garage that was black, red, and white and had a rear flat tire. Now, the reason that this is important is because police do believe that Tim rode a bike to Becky's house on the night of her murder. And if Tim were to have ridden a bike from his house to Becky's house, it would have taken him less than five minutes to get there. Now, part of the reason that this case has gotten a lot of attention, as I mentioned in the beginning, you guys may have heard about this case in the media, is because this case is being referred to as the family feud murders. And the reason for that is because in the year 2020, Tim and his family were on an episode of the TV show Family Feud. And if you're unfamiliar with Family Feud, it is a game show that's hosted by Steve Harvey. And the premise of this show is that two families go up against each other. You have one family on one side, another family on the other, and Steve Harvey goes through and asks them different fill-in-the-blank type of questions, and you're supposed to answer the -the fill-in-the-blank based on what you believe the public would say. So you're trying to guess what the most popular answer from the public would be, and based on that, you get a certain amount of points. I also apologize if that's not the best description of the show. I don't really watch Family Feud. However, I do kind of know the premise of it. So in the year 2020, Tim went on Family Feud with his parents and his brothers. And while he was on Family Feud, he was asked the question, what is the worst mistake that you can make on your wedding day? And I'm just going to let you listen to what he said in his answer. What's the biggest mistake you made at your wedding? Honey, I love you, but said I do. (laughs) Not my mistake. Not my mistake. I love my wife. So as you can tell, Tim responds to this by saying that saying I do was the biggest mistake that someone could make on their wedding and tries to backpedal a little bit, tries to say that it's not his mistake, it's just what he thinks people would say because he loves his wife and then goes on to joke about it a little bit afterwards by saying, I'm gonna get in trouble about that later, aren't I? Now, at first, at first glance when this episode aired, Tim just seemed like a little bit of a jerk for a lack of a better word, to have an answer such as that. However, looking back on that episode, and also knowing that not even a year after that episode was aired, Tim filed for divorce from Becky, it's very, very disturbing. Tim was officially arrested on March 13th of 2023 for the murder of Becky Bleefnick. Tim has been charged with two counts of first-degree murder and one count of home invasion. Now, the information I have given you thus far has been the information that has been presented at the trial, and the prosecution has a strong strong argument that theorizes that in the early morning hours of February 23rd, Tim left his home where his three boys were sleeping in the middle of the night and rode his bike from his house to Becky's home. It's believed that he attempted to use his crowbar to open the front door. However, when he was unsuccessful, he attempted to go through the window. The reason that they believe that he went through the window not only was because the window was open, but but there was also a chair that was leaning up against the house that Tim would have been able to use to step on to get into Becky's room. Police believe that once Tim did get inside of the home, there was a strong struggle between him and Becky and that Becky did her best to fight back. They believe that Tim chased Becky through her home as she frantically attempted to call 911. They then believe that Becky ran into her bedroom and shut the door behind her. However, Tim shot Becky through the bathroom door where she then fell to the ground. They then believe that Tim opened the bathroom door and continued to shoot Becky several more times before leaving the house through the front door and also leaving Becky to die a slow and painful death. 
So that is the prosecution's argument. However, the defense, on the other hand, believes that even though Tim and Becky were going through a very stressful and tense divorce, that does not mean that Tim is the killer. They believe that the evidence against Tim is all circumstantial and that Tim is an easy target. The defense stated that they believe that this could have easily been a crime of opportunity, and they also pointed fingers at the man that Becky was dating at the time of her murder. At the time that she was killed, Becky had been recently seeing a man named Ted Johnson. Ted and Becky met back in January of 2022 and began seeing e- and began seeing each other romantically that summer. The last time that Ted and Becky saw each other was on February 21st, the day after she had gotten surgery. Ted had picked up food for Becky and delivered it to her house and hung out there with her for about an hour. He helped her get situated for the night and helped her get into bed. And on the evening of February 22nd, just hours before Becky's death, the two had been texting. Becky told Ted that she was just doing laundry and paying some bills, but she was excited to see her boys the following day and she was excited to drive again since her surgery had restricted her from doing so. Ted and Becky ended their night with a 26-minute phone call at 9.47 p.m. before they hung up for the night. Ted continued to text Becky the following morning on the 23rd, however, got no response. Now, the defense stated that Ted also owned a gun, which he did. Ted owned a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson gun, and while he also used a 9 millimeter handgun, he had lost that to his ex-wife in their divorce settlement. Now, something the defense also pointed out was that Ted had been keeping a bag of money for Becky. Becky had given him $13,000 in cash that Ted had been keeping in his safe. However, Ted claims that he did not know what was in the bag. Becky had given Ted the bag, not telling him what was inside of it, and asked him to hold on to it for her for a little bit. And Ted said that he never opened the bag and saw what was inside of it. And he claims that after Becky's death, when police told him that there was $13,000 inside of the bag, that was was the first time that he had ever known that. So basically, the defense was trying to paint a picture that Ted also could have had a motive because he was holding on to $13,000 for Becky. The defense asked Ted if he had left his house on the late night hours of the 22nd or on the early morning hours of the 23rd, and Ted said that he did not remember if he did. On the stand, Ted was very emotional, and he stated that Becky was relieved that the divorce was soon to be finished between her and and Tim. And that is where we are currently at this trial. I am filming this episode on May 28th of 2023. So in this upcoming week, there are going to be a lot more major developments and I will definitely be following along and keeping you guys updated on the Killer Instinct Instagram. So make sure you're following that. It is just Killer Instinct Podcast. And with that being said, you guys, that is this case. If Tim is convicted on the charges that he is charged with, he will be facing a 45 year to life prison sentence without any possibility of parole. So I am very interested to hear what you guys have to say about this one. And again, with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to another episode of Killer Instinct. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Again, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast podcast every Wednesday and on YouTube as well. You're not going to want to miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys.